Hello and welcome to the second of our two-part webinar series on moving your case teaching online quickly. My name is Antoinette Mills from the Case Centre and I'm going to be the host today. Um, as some of you will know, especially those of you that came to our webinar last week, the Case Centre is a not-for-profit organisation and a charity and our mission is to advance the case method worldwide. Now, as part of our activities to support the case community, we run a programme of case writing and teaching workshops around the world. And I'm really delighted today that two of our longtime workshop tutors, Martin Cup and Urs Muller, are joining us to facilitate this webinar. Martin is Associate Professor of Entrepreneurship at ESCP Business School in France, and he's been one of our workshop tutors since 2008. Um, and Urs is Associate Professor of Practice at SDA Bocconi School of Management, and he's also an Affiliate Programme Director at ESMT Berlin in Germany. He's been a workshop tutor since 2014, um, and this year he was nominated by his students and he won our Outstanding Case Teacher competition. So it's a real delight to have both of these guys here. Um, before I hand over to them, there are just a few housekeeping points um, before we get started. Um, we've got a lot of participants from around the world, so we have muted you all. Some of you have been asking that already, and this is just really for ease of running the webinar. Um, but we are going to try and make the webinar interactive, um, and Martin and Urs will be using the chat facility throughout the webinar to ask you for opinions, and um, they're also going to be using some polls. But please, could you keep the comments in the chat focused on what Martin and Urs are asking you, um, rather than just chit-chat, um, so that we can really maximise what we get out of this webinar. You should find the chat along the bottom of your Zoom window, um, and some of you have already found that now, I can see. Um, we are recording the webinar, so just a reminder about that. We'll send you all a link to that tomorrow in a follow-up email. Um, so I'm hoping that Martin and Urs have done their hair so that uh, they're going to look lovely on the recording. Yeah. Um, anyway, it gives me really great pleasure to hand over to Martin and Urs for what I'm sure is going to be a fascinating session. So over to you guys. So uh, also from my side, a very warm welcome uh, to this uh, webinar and uh, I already raised my arms, but it's, uh, it's really great to be doing this with Urs, the outstanding case teacher uh, of the year. So uh, thank you for joining us. You also want to greet the participants, Urs. Yeah, I'm uh, very delighted to be here. Um, let's see what we can jointly learn uh, because we really would like to also um, involve you in our discussions uh, because very much along the line of the case study method, we fundamentally believe that um, it's not only the students and participants that can learn uh, from participant-centered learning, but also the other way around. We typically learn a lot. Right. Great, so, so let's start. Um, we had a small question already at the beginning of, uh, like as the introduction uh, or, or the invitation um, to this uh, webinar, uh, very, very similar to the one last week with uh, Angela Lee from Colombia. And we asked uh, your experience with cases and we see we have a quite experienced group here. So very few, around 10% who have uh, not used cases before. Uh, a lot of people use them occasionally, uh, but almost half of you regularly. So, so I think uh, you are experienced case teachers and we will we'll try to build upon that uh, in this uh, hour that we have together. So maybe just to give a little bit of context uh, to, uh, to what we try to achieve in here. Um, it, it is important uh, when, when we uh, designed this, uh, this webinar, Urs and I, uh, we both agreed that it's very important to set a couple of expectations right at the beginning. Uh, so we, we think we are, or we hope we are, uh, uh, case experts, because that's what we've been doing for quite some time. Uh, and we've been both teaching and writing. And for quite some time now, we are also working on a book, which one day hopefully gets uh, ready and published. But we, we think we are case experts, but we are not online teaching ex experts. So we are all in this together. We are in, in the midst of taking uh, our courses, our cases online. Um, and 
we in this webinar we really focus on case teaching um, uh, for the ones who've been uh, at uh, Angela's webinar last week uh, that was also very much about case teaching but also about teaching uh, uh, online in general so we'll try to focus really on on the aspect of, of uh, teaching we will take you through or we will offer you different what we think are important steps uh, from selecting cases all the way to closing a session um, and as Antoinette already said because that's typically always a very very early questions recording and slides will be shared afterwards yeah uh, let me take over here I think uh, before we go into the details on how to take a case session online uh, I think we all agree on some of the challenges uh, in the online. And if we if we overlook, all look at kind of the reluctance and of our entire industry to move to online uh, teaching, I think uh, a significant part of this reluctance was driven by a joint observation that we have from, you know, kind of normal interactions online that we are afraid that online leads to boredom, it leads to silence, inactivity, it, uh, it tends to overemphasize on lecturing elements. Uh, and we all know that, you know, we have these kind of devices, we have the ability to switch screens and do all kinds of things. And we are afraid to lose the attention of our students. And this is, this is a concern that I believe many of you, as you are currently taking face-to-face -face classes online, have, and the two of us have exactly the same challenge. Okay, and um, admittedly, we don't have the silver bullet solution. Uh, we are not in a position to tell you all the things, but on basis of our familiarity with the case method, I think we can make a couple of points. And, and one of the benefits is that cases tend to enhance interaction in the classroom. Um, compared to many other learning formats, if you use a case, um, in a face-to-face -face setting, you would typically have much more excitement, energy in the room, controversy and debate. Um, and we believe that one of the benefits of using the case method online is that, yeah, it might not be the same experience as in face-to-face, -face, but you can take some of this excitement into the online world. And we believe that this is a benefit. It's probably not the only learning method that you want to employ if you run an entire long course for a full semester or for many, many sessions, many days, you will not be able to run the entire course on, ba uh, on basis of cases only, uh, or it might be just too repetitive and boring, but it is probably a good component. Now, almost anything else that you can do is not guaranteed to be a bigger success than cases. So yes, maybe taking a case session online doesn't work as in face-to-face, -face. you might be disappointed, but remind yourselves, and this is something that we do currently right now, is you say, yeah, it might not be as exciting to discuss the case online, but nevertheless, it's better than me kind of lecturing and doing what we are doing essentially right now, unfortunately. Uh, reading from PowerPoint slides and, and talking at our participants and students, okay? And, and there's one big advantage of the current situation. Everybody understands that we have no choice, that we do it in a pragmatic and ad hoc way to transfer our normal classes into an online world. And the level of understanding and tolerance from our participants will be significantly higher compared to other teaching situations. If, if we screw up right now, not good. Uh, it's not uh, what we want, but it's less harmful than in other situations. Um, I just wanted to remind you, I, we, we've seen that about two thirds of our participants have been participants last week with Angela Lee. And Angela had really a great, great session. So the, the webinar, the recording is uh, available on uh, the, the website of the Case Center. I can just invite you to go and, uh, and have a look. It's really, it, it, it's really a fantastic session. Uh, time flies by. And she basically had three main points. Uh, 
that, 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 that she went through and, and in, in uh, great length and detail. Uh, and she said, online teaching is all about clarity, engagement, and accountability. And, and I think these are really, really valid points. And while we structure our webinar differently, we'll come back to uh, clarity, we'll come back to engagement, we'll also come back to account uh, accountability at various points. Uh, and uh, so, so I think this is really good. It's, it's really complimentary. And I can just go back and watch the recording with uh, Angela. Uh, so basically, our idea is that we offer you some some of our ideas and experiences that we have of taking uh, cases online along the typical process of case teaching. Uh, and we, we figured that the typical process of case teaching um, involves several steps. And we just, for, for the purpose of this webinar, but also when we do our face-to-face uh, -face, uh, seminars, we typically talk about seven steps. It starts all with the case selection. So you have to somehow select the right case for the session. Then you have to develop your teaching plan. You would start the preparation of the actual teaching. And then the moment has come, the session starts, right? And you have to open the case discussion. You have to run the case discussion. We separated this. I mean, you could have obviously have that uh, in one, but we think these are these are big elements and, and uh, uh, there's so much to say. That's why we structured in opening, running, and then of course closing. And then there are, uh, there is an entire set of additional points uh, that you could think of. We just said others or questions around, well, how can we take this from a single session with the case to a whole course, which is case-based. But these are uh, more on the others. Now, we could run you basically just through the process, uh, but we thought, why not put the emphasis on those parts where you really, where your questions are? Because we, we titled this webinar Shared Experience. So I think that's what we should do. We should focus on the parts which are really important for you. And we should share experiences. Obviously, these experiences are on the one hand, ours and my experiences, but we'll try to get your experiences in uh, as good as we can. What we would like to see from you is if you if you basically take this very generic process, um, what are the things with which you are currently struggling most? I mean, what what if we debate any which of these process steps will help you most in taking your uh, uh, sessions online? right now and then what our idea is that we will start with the processes process steps that you basically prioritize and um, we would always like to have a mix between uh, us martin or myself giving uh, a little bit of input but then we would also like to see more specifically what are your exact questions or do you have a very creative solution did you hear about something from a colleague what is uh, what are the experiences that you have made so maybe you can quickly answer to the poll so that we focus on what is really important to you okay um, so the general flow is that we share our experiences. We've divided the points up a little bit, but we'll share our experiences. So one of us digs into uh, running the session. Obviously that was almost half of you. So that's the most urgent. So we're gonna spend most or, or, or uh, uh, more time on that running the session. Uh, while we share our experiences, we invite you to type in your questions into the chat. So. For example, running the session, Urs will lead that. Um, then I will focus on the, on the chat, see what you're posting, and I'll try to get a sense of where your questions are heading. And once Urs is ready with sharing his opinion, I'm gonna dig into some of the questions that came up while he was talking uh, that came up in the chat box. Um, okay, 
So now I have to find, of course, running the session. And here we are, running the session. Exactly. Or, so if, you just, if, you, if you just move immediately, exactly. So, um, I mean, one of the things that we typically spend a significant amount of time on is when we talk about face-to-face -face delivery of uh, case sessions, is the need to constantly change the learning format over a longer period of time, because we all know that uh, if you were to run a full class case debate over 90 minutes, 75, 60 minutes, whatever the duration of a session is in your cases, it would get repetitive and boring. And the idea, of course, is to bring excitement into the classroom. Now, in online, this is even more important because every single break in methodology and learning format gives an opportunity to basically re-invite participants that were in the process of dozing off and getting uh, um, basically lost in other activities or not listening carefully again and again. So change the learning format more frequently even than you would do so in a face-to-face -face session is certainly something that I think is key. Now, the second is, and this will be varying a lot uh, dependent on the technology that you're using. Um, obviously, technology can help us to bring variation um, into the game. So for example, currently we are using Zoom webinar, but there is also, of course, Zoom meeting function. If you use Zoom, uh, there is the breakout rooms functionality. It's there, use it. Uh, but then also, how can you make use of other technologies in order to increase uh, interaction in the classroom. So for example, the polling uh, functionality that you just saw in action for this webinar, within Zoom is, from my perspective, very limited. It allows very these kind of simple questions. But there are tools that uh, we tend to use a lot in our teachings anyway, especially when we're talking about larger groups or when we actually like to get anonymous feedback from participants. Uh, like um, polling software, like Qualtrics, if you basically want to use it also for um, kind of publications and academic research, for example. I personally like Mentimeter a lot, I use it a lot, but there are also many other poll everywhere, Poll Daddy, Kahoot, Socrative, etc. There are many polling softwares uh, that you can use in order to ask all kinds of questions, etc. Then there's, of course, the question of uh, 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 whiteboards, okay? In, in normal classrooms, we have um, lots of opportunities to uh, write things down and take notes, especially of the entire discussions. And we, um, both Martin and I, we frequently use the board in order to distill out of our students and participants' comments, tools, frameworks, theories, and concepts that we want to teach. Now, uh, obviously, sometimes you might be able to use plain and simple a PowerPoint. Uh, if you have the right devices, you can uh, basically write it. Uh, what you see in the background of Martin is, for example, he has a whiteboard. Why not do it like this? Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, there are specialized softwares. But um, if you have any of these, uh, play around with them and use them as much as possible. Uh, we just need to be a little bit aware about some of the technological problems. So, for example, some of you might be uh, joining our webinar on basis of a mobile phone with a very small screen. And then um, if Martin is showing in parallel, sharing his screen in parallel, probably you will have a hard time to read what he's writing on the whiteboard. But to the extent that it's possible, use all of that just so that it's a change and it's not constantly a talking head reading PowerPoint slides, okay? Now, one of the problems of online teaching is that it does take a bit more time because every single time a participant wants to say something, they cannot just do it spontaneously. They need to unmute. You might need to unmute them, et cetera, et cetera. In order to steer the discussions, they need to raise their hands and maybe they are lost on the second or third screen of the gallery view. Um, so 
in order to kind of compensate for this loss of time, it is absolutely helpful to also break uh, the formats by, for example, giving more assignments into the group. And, uh, and obviously, uh, we are online, right? We are right now online. You are invited to use your uh, electronic devices in order to join this, uh, this session. So why not use it and invite people to do, for example, a quick check on a certain fact, uh, which you can basically allocate to individual participants. And all these kind of things, I think, make a lot of sense. Questions are obviously key. And um, most of you, on basis of your vast experience or the significant experience uh, in terms of case teaching, know that there is a difference between what we call open questions and closed questions. Open questions are questions like, what do you mean? Where does this lead us, etc.?" And closed questions are questions that uh, require more simple yes, no, black and white type of answers. Um, in order to um, steer the discussion in a more meaningful way, um, we've made the experience that in online formats, we tend to ask a little bit fewer open-ended question and to ask somewhat more focused, targeted, and closed questions, um, which obviously shouldn't lead us to just use our students in order to wait for the keywords that we need in order to move on. It should still be participant-centered. They should have an opportunity to contribute a lot. Um, but uh, think very carefully about the questions. And if you read good teaching notes, they will usually have a very significant number of good questions. Um, write down the questions and think very specifically about which questions are meaningful uh, in your session. Uh, were there other questions so far, Martin? No. Did I anyone make a good experience? something that uh, you particularly liked. I mean, obviously none of these is rocket science and totally surprising. Now the questions come in. Ah, the yes. power of Excellent. science. Sometimes you just have to wait. Yes, uh, which okay. Im important point, Martin, uh, that you are making right now. I've, I've observed that a lot, I mean, I, I uh, had the pleasure of attending a couple of online sessions, real sessions, not just webinars, but, you know, traditional case format debates. Um, and yes, the willingness and patience of instructors that I've observed to wait and be silent in online is typically even smaller than in face-to-face. -face. And I think just take the time if that's important. So let's have a look at some of the questions. Yes. One question is, could you please elaborate on pros and cons, and now it, uh, of different Paul softwares? Yeah. I Can mean, you? as I said, I personally use mostly Qualtrics and Mentimeter. I use Qualtrics, for example, extensively in um, a asynchronous online course that I've developed. Why? Because then it's easier for me to dis extract uh, the data, uh, to, to work with the data, and then to feed it back into my, my class. Um, partially because the result reports are stable. Whereas, for example, Mentimeter is very much driven by a logic that you run it in a, in a, in a synchronous format. Uh, the, this exact code and the URL, for example, change. I'm not a full expert on, um, on all of these services, and um, I don't wanna make advertisement for any of them, but for example, uh, look at some of them. Uh, I personally like the way in which Mentimeter works, the animation and the style. Um, that it is for free, give it a try. Uh, but also ask around, maybe your institution has bulk uh, uh, agreements and licenses with other providers. Okay, then Peter, Peter, Peter O'Connor mentioned breakouts are key. 
uh, they wake people up uh, and, uh, and people cannot hide in a, in a breakout because it's a smaller group. So I can, I can just stress this point. Uh, so Peter, uh, I, I would fully agree. Uh, I think it's even more important than in face-to-face, -face, uh, but it comes back to, to um, it's not only breakouts, uh, but it's, it's like changing formats uh, uh, over and over again. And I think that was, at least for me, and, and everybody uh, obviously takes away different things from different uh, uh, webinars, but one of the, the main takeaways also from uh, Angela's uh, session was really mix and match, right? Try, mix, experiment, try different things. The pace has to be fast and you have to, uh, you have to uh, basically over, over, over speed or over emphasize uh, maybe compared to, to our typical face-to-face. Susan and then, asks about chat function. Let me quickly pick up this, uh, this question. Susan, uh, I think this depends very much on uh, the participant size. Uh, as you will have seen, for example, this is a webinar because we have so many participants. We were in, in, even anticipating higher numbers than the 70. Uh, there would be just too much noise and it would too, take too much if everyone would unmute and mute themselves and it would be too difficult to watch out for the raised hand. So we allow the chat function uh, as our way for you to interact with us, ask questions and contribute. In normal class settings, uh, especially if I'm the only educator, I would probably not uh, do that. And I typically ask participants not to use the chat function, but to rather ask questions in the group. Uh, if, for example, the class is fairly small, if, I, I, if it's a group of 20 or even less, uh, I think we are educated enough in the technology to uh, to use the normal voice function um, if the group size is getting too much if the um, if the discipline of the participants is not very high then you need to do add more moderation but the chat function is difficult because you you have your presentations you might have a teaching note in front of you a case in front of you your teaching plan the good questions and there's only so many things that you can uh, draw your attention to at the very same time. So probably the chat function is not ideal. Okay, I have one more um, from Wolfgang. Wolfgang Ulaga asks, what is the single most important difference when running a session? Um, and, and probably we all have different uh, experiences. For me, it's energy. Uh, for me, it's energy. It's um, my own energy, participants' energy, uh, and the, the capability of monitoring energy, uh, both the participants' energy, but also my, uh, my own. Uh, you, you see already one way how I adapt to it. Uh, I stand up now. Uh, that, that's one of the things which is important for me. It's important for my energy. Um, when I sit down, I have a different energy. I sit, uh, which obviously also has advantages, right? You, it's easier to take notes. Uh, you can have the student gallery and so on. Um, it's important to stand up, so that's that's what I choose. Uh, obviously, this has downsides as well. Uh, the last two two and a half days, I was teaching an executive program basically round the round the clock, and it was just very very long to stand up. But hey, I normally I'm also standing up, so it shouldn't be that much of a difference. But I guess because the movement is different and so on. But but energy is for me uh, the the single most. Uh, uh, the, the biggest difference, and now it's up to us to be a little bit creative to think about how can we how can we increase the energy, and not only the participants' energy, but also your own energy. Uh, so so that's uh, that's for me. Uh, there were a couple more. Maybe we take one more because it's really the 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 biggest chunk, and then we have to move on uh, to some of the other elements. Mm -hmm. um, there's one on what types of case we'll come to the selection. Um, there was a question around the, the, the use of board. And um, I mean, this is one domain where I particularly suffer a lot in online. I, I make extensive use of the board when I teach cases by myself. And it's typically not a simple list of word comments. It's pictures, it's visualizations. And I try to distill uh, things out of the participants' comments, and then I will group the comments in various different ways. Now, 
I cannot replicate it. Yeah, um, it's partially a technology issue. Do I have the right devices? But then also it just, it doesn't feel the same way. So what I need to do is I need to force myself to be much more specific in with respect to what do I want to, uh, to visualize. And what are the things that I really put on any type of board equivalent in the online space and what do I not want to have there? Um, and uh, the way I do it is that um, I basically add, because I use PowerPoint for my, for my board uh, methodology, I will add um, kind of uh, empty slides that already have a little bit of the structure. And uh, for example, what I've seen others do is, for example, if you want to do the business model canvas, you can basically take the business model canvas and then enter the different things into it. In my case, I would typically rather use, I don't know, depends. I might have a two by two metrics and then I will use, a, I, I might already have the grid. If I use two columns, I already might have a two column uh, PowerPoint design upfront, uh, but you can see, you can probably be less spontaneous in the use of boards compared to what you would do in, in a normal setting if you have lots of space for boards. I would fully agree. Um, I, I, that's why I love to have uh, the whiteboard here, but with the downside that Urs already mentioned, um, so uh, that, that sometimes people have a tough time uh, reading it. So uh, I have to completely admit the whiteboard is more for me probably because I need to take notes and to structure my thought uh, while I'm teaching. Uh, but, but that would be, again, a mix and match. Okay, uh, I think this was, this was there, there, there are really there, there are, uh, more great questions and some, some very, very specific questions like how do you actually then write and type uh, onto Zoom uh, whiteboard, for example. So everybody is always invited to also share their knowledge on the chat to answer people, to give them uh, uh, hints and, and to, to, to share uh, your experience because that's what this session is, is really about. So, so we opened the space and we gave you our examples and, and then uh, obviously you can uh, 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 add to that. Um, the next and and by the way, thank you very much for everybody who is suggesting things. So I see uh, Wolfgang suggesting open Google uh, uh, Google Docs. I personally don't like Google Docs, um, but I um, and would therefore rather do it in slides. But this uh, these are all uh, very much appreciated. Uh, the whiteboard function in Zoom, I've never used it, uh, but. Uh, it's interesting to see Peter and Jerome, thank you very much for con uh, uh, suggesting that iPad and pencil, again, I've not used it. I prefer to use um, rather two separate screens um, and PowerPoints that works for me the best, but um, try to find your way and it will very much depend on, for example, things like group size, uh, internet bandwidth, the physical devices that the electronic devices that you have, um, all of that will make a difference. And Martin is showing us right now that it's not the same as if you draw on a whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. But these okay. are all, all, all some of the things. Okay. Um, but we had, basically, if I remember rightly, not only remember, I of course took notes, uh, otherwise I would not remember. Uh, teaching plan development was up second. So and I think Martin, Lorena's question right now is perfectly fitting to that. Yeah? Lorena is saying that feeling that her feeling is that online use of cases requires more preparation on the side of the students. Yeah. Maybe that would be a good point to discuss. Absolutely. Uh, now I have to erase. You see, I, I try to erase, erase. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna move over to teaching plan development. And uh, I, let me, I, I will start first and I'll come back to the question on the preparation from the student side. I wanna start very briefly with, with basically, because 
I think one of the common themes, at least what I hear also in, in other webinars, but what I hear when I, when I listen to Urs is, uh, we should not forget the fundamentals. Uh, the online is more of an adjust, it's not like we have, to, we have to reinvent everything, but we have to rethink or we have to come back to the fundamentals that we, uh, that, that we should think about anyhow in a face-to-face -face, uh, uh, discussion, and then think about what advantages does online give us to achieve these objectives that we have. So I want to very quickly come back to some of these fundamentals. And now I have to get the mouse back. So the first would be when you develop a teaching plan, uh, the first question that, that we t uh, tend to ask ourselves is, well, the flow of the session that you're preparing uh, will depend on the nature of your subject. Uh, and that's also something that always comes in, in, discussing, uh, in discussing the case session that people will say, well, but you see, I'm from finance and in finance is different. Or somebody says, well, I'm from leadership and leadership is different. I'm, I'm from entrepreneurship. Um, but, but I think fundamentally, the, the differences are not by, by disciplines, but the, this, the, the, the differences are really, do you have a convergent topic or do you have a divergent topic? Uh, and, and by that we mean there are some topics that you will discuss and that can be in, in the same discipline you can have convergent and divergent topics, but maybe certain disciplines tend to have one more than the other. But the, the fundamental idea is what, what is the session, the case that I use, how do I use it? Do I use it to come to one specific solution towards the end, convergent? Or do I want to open it up? Uh, that's the first thing I think we should remember or we remind ourselves. The second is that, that teaching in general, again, face-to-face -face as online, uh, is taking students on a journey. Taking students on a journey which involves different elements and different ways to learn. And we, we typically, in our, our uh, workshops that we, uh, that we do, Urs and I, we typically at some point always show the slide where we say, well, there are different elements of learning. We learn in different ways. Of course, there's learning by getting knowledge, knowledge input. But then you can learn by taking action, by trying things. And then you would get feedback on what you've tried, feedback from others, feedback from the market, feedback from, and you might then get knowledge input. Or you could start by thinking through a problem, building your own hypothesis about, hmm, how, how do these problems relate, conceptualize, and then come back to class or have the class uh, uh, up in front. And in face-to-face, -face, as in online, I think these are relevant concepts to think through when you plan for the session. And now, having said that in, in a more general way, what are then the specificities of, of online? Uh, and I think online opens up new possibilities uh, in a certain way. I mean, not always. Again, it depends on your institution and depends on your, your context. But very often, when I think back, when you're, when you're pure face-to-face, -face, you very often do not take into account the possibilities you have of asynchronous learning, asynchronous hypothesizing, conceptualizing, and so on. So I think the moment we are forced towards online, we suddenly realize that the, that the um, sphere of possibilities is, back, uh, is bigger. And that's what I would say the first thing is, Think of the full spectrum of possibilities, synchronous and asynchronous. And I think that's, that's key. Like when we take now cases online, think about which part of this experience will be really together online, synchronous, and which parts can I take out and can leave up to people to adapt to the time that they like, the speed that they like, so to really customize it or, or make it individual. So, so I think that's the first. Think of all the possibilities. Then align the formats with your teaching objectives. 
and try to get the most out of each format. I think each format has pros and cons. Obviously, you can use each format in any way, but certain formats will, will make make specific will will make it easier to achieve certain learning objects for example uh, knowledge input i would argue but again everybody but that's something that you probably can do very very well asynchronous if it's purely knowledge why not let people learn when and where and how fast they want uh, and asynchronous could be could be articles, could be videos, could be all kinds of things where people do that individually. We don't have to be all together in front of our screens and somehow create a community if it is just purely about knowledge. Action and feedback, well, if people take action and get feedback, again, maybe you could even say action is asynchronous, feedback is synchronous. Hypothesizing, conceptualizing, again, you might think about, well, when is it, when is it important? Um, maybe that's synchronous, that you develop hypothesis and you conceptualize together with a group of people, but maybe not with the whole big panel. Maybe breakouts would be the right thing. And uh, a last, last part, and this basically comes back to, uh, to uh, uh, one point that we uh, uh, discussed already. Uh, think early about visualizing your session. Um, but we discussed that already. We discussed Google Docs, Zoom, and so on. But this is, for me, this belongs in the teaching uh, a plan development, is think up front. How do you want, when do you want to visualize? How important is that? Like, for me, it's very important to, to sometimes write on the board, but how important is it really? Or it's already mentioned. So now I want to quickly, although it's not on the slide, but I want to want to start going into the into the discussion by coming back to the preparation. Yes, absolutely. The preparation by the students is absolutely key. And it comes back a little bit maybe to the first point. Think of the full spectrum of possibilities. Even in our in our workshop on face to face teaching, we always say that teaching starts well before you enter the classroom. So teaching starts well before we start this webinar or we start the online session. Uh, and that's exactly, I think, where, where this question goes. So you have to think about, and again, online gives you more po possibilities, right? You, you now potentially have more channels to reach the students and to set the right tone. I think in the past, we basically, we, we had very little, uh, traditionally, we had very little challenge, channels to communicate with the students before our session. We either sent out emails or maybe we have a Blackboard or a Moodle environment. But now with all these new technologies, I think we, we can rethink and, and, and think about like how do we engage with students before the session. And that's extremely important. This brings back the synchronous versus asynchronous. When do you start communicating? What do you say? Which channels do you use? How do you set the right tone? And I think also to prepare students. Um, all the, like, how many questions do you give up front? So I would agree, online teaching, um, online teaching can put, a, like, will, I would say online teaching will reinforce the importance of preparation on the student side. But the good part, we also have more channels, more tools, and more ways to do that, and also to control. To you, Urs. Yeah, uh, um, as you were talking, uh, I did see a question from Barat, who was asking about quantitative versus qualitative uh, cases. And uh, Barat says that he perceives it to be particularly challenging to uh, teach quantitative cases. Now, let me say, I think we all find the transition from face-to-face -face case teaching to online, we all find it challenging. But let me challenge you here a little bit. I teach mostly ethics. Uh, and obviously, in order to allow for a good ethical discussion, I need controversy in the room. I need some people who say this is the right thing to do and some people who say that is the right thing to do. And in order to elaborate that point, it will take time and it's much more difficult to steer a controversy 
because certain things that work in face to face, like I make one part, I basically split the room and have everybody in favor of paying a bribe on one side and everybody against on another side. These kind of techniques will not work in online. I, I structurally believe that if you teach a quantitative subject, you sometimes might even have an advantage if you move online. Why? Because for example, if it requires a preparation on basis of an Excel sheet or a database or some sort of analysis, you can ask your participants to do that before your synchronous session and then, or during a breakout, and then they can share their screens with the full analysis, with all the formulas, with all the results in a very easy way that is probably more time efficient than them coming to the front and putting in a USB or sending you a file with their analysis. That's all just much more complicated. So I, I essentially believe that for certain types, not for all quantitative subjects, but for certain types of quantitative uh, cases, it might actually be almost easier. And, and just, just to add to that, because Lorena just also posted, um, I've done quantitative case by using asynchronous videos that help students to learn the required calculations so that I can devote the online streaming session to discuss the decisions. And I think that's really the point. Um, by the way, I can, again, I just, this is cross-selling, so to say, cross-marketing. Um, Angela is, is teaching a lot of quant, uh, like VC uh, uh, decision making, uh, and she gave a couple of interesting examples. Uh, for example, uh, the one I remember is also, she uses then polls to test how many people have basically what, it, what result, and if it is a convergent topic, right, there is a right answer, like, in, like you said. And if you poll different, different results, you get an immediately, immediate sense like, oh, one third of my class all have the wrong answer. I, guess I have to redo certain things. Whereas sometimes you might, might get 100% got the right answer. So it gives you immediately the thing to move on. But I think what, what Lorena just mentioned is really, and that goes back to, to where I started, is really, to think about the pros and cons of the different formats and to use each to its best. If we force people to be at the same time in front of a device, we should make the most out of it. Especially, to, I mean, today, because, because we, we might have people in other time zones who are forced to get up or be, be up late just to, to join the session. And it would just be a shame if, if they don't get the most out of it. So, so I, would really, I would really always step back and think about like which format has, like with which format can I reach my, my learning objectives the most efficient. Okay. With respect to time, uh, Martin, let's, I think the third most frequently asked question uh, was around case study selection. And I think we don't have a lot of time, but maybe we can quickly go there. Absolutely. Isn't it perfect? It goes always back and forth because case selection is your topic. <laughs> perfect, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I mean, our general advice is always pick cases that are as short as possible without compromising on our learning objective. Sometimes we need complex and long cases because that's part of our learning objective, but unless the ability to distill relevant, to separate relevant from irrelevant and digesting significant uh, uh, data is part of your learning objectives, the basic uh, instruction is try to find cases that are as short as possible. And this is, I think, particularly true here because you need to be more concise in the delivery of your session because you have less, you are going to inevitably lose time, uh, partially because it takes longer to teach online and partially because you will probably have um, a, a bigger variety of learning formats and therefore spend less time online than you would have spent face to face. Um, now, it might make sense uh, if, if when we teach case methods, Martin and I, we are typically very agnostic and say, well, if you, if you want to use a video, an expert, a guest, uh, an article as case 
style material, that's great. Uh, and I think this is still true. The only addition, modification that I would like to make to this statement and overall philosophy is that in online, you might need to be a little bit more, you, you might need to provide material that is a bit more pre-digested uh, than you would use in a classroom, in a typical face-to-face -face classroom setting. Why? Because you will probably leave a little bit more work to your students and maybe they need a little bit more guidance. So if you find, if you have a decent case that is kind of readily available in one of the big case distributors, it might be easier to use that for an online session compared to um, just an article, a scientific article or a, a, a general news and media article. Unless, of course, for example, uh, um, it's unavoidable. So for example, I teach ethics, obviously in a class that I will teach in, in a week from now, I'm going to have a session on the uh, business ethic impact uh, dimensions of the corona crisis. There is no such case, I need to use uh, not digested material, but, but then that's it, yeah? And, and this is kind of the last comment on this slide. The, the learning objective here is clear, is key. What is the objective, what do you want your students to learn in every single session that you teach online? And then you need to align, and I know this is very generic and not very surprising, but the challenge is here now to basically really always come back to this, this question and ask yourself, what do I really want my students and participants to take away? And then, to structure the material, or to select the material on basis of that and structure the session on basis of that. Perfect. I think honestly, it's already 54 and Antoinette also wants to uh, probably wrap things up a little bit. I would, I would like to add maybe two or three thoughts uh, and I have, I have of course also a final slide. You will see, you'll get all the slides. You will see we only covered not even a third of, of what we prepared and that's fine. Uh, but it shows also that not only the preparation on side of the students is, might be a little bit bigger, also on us. Obviously we had to prepare, we had to think through what could be the questions. We went through the process we, we prepared all the steps, but then we, we tried, we talked about it and said like, we should talk about the things that people are interested the most and keep their questions. So we integrated the poll, only now took uh, the time to have three phases of the seven that we really discussed, but got you in, in, into, the, uh, into the chat and into uh, your experiences. There were, we did not read out all the experiences. There was a lot of knowledge sharing on the chat. Thank you very much for that. That's really important. Um, I think our fundamental message was, is really try things, mix uh, formats and, and experiment. Like we did ourselves. We just tried to experiment. For example, why have it with two people? We hope that it would be a little bit more engaging, that you hear different voices. One is standing up. One is sitting down, one has hair, the other has a nice shirt. You know, all these different things. So try different things uh, that, that, that you want. Uh, and don't be afraid because this is the right time to do that. So you will get all the slides, uh, maybe too many, but I think they are uh, self-explanatory. And this is always my favorite slide. Mr. Osborne, may I be excused? My brain is full. I hope this was interesting for you. Uh, I hope you got one or two nuggets out of this. Uh, probably there were also lots of things that you obviously as experienced case teachers are very aware of, but we're all twisting and tweaking and trying to adjust. Uh, I think it's exciting times uh, and thank you very much uh, for joining us. We are currently writing a book and so on case method, and <laughs> this, is no, this is no advertisement break yet, uh, it's the other no, way. it might only be ready we in three have, years. <laughs> no, but I mean, uh, honestly, if you have more ideas, send them our way. Um, we'll try to share them. If you have any idea that we didn't include yet in our slides, if you want to, if you have something, send us an email. Um, we'll include it in the PowerPoint and distribute it. And uh, I'm pretty sure that 
um, there were, for example, a couple of ideas that we will absolutely uh, imitate in our own online teaching and uh, possibly then also include in the book. Thank you so much from my side as well. And the final word goes to Antoinette. Thank you guys. Well, it's been really brilliant. Thank you uh, for, for a really fascinating session and thanks to everyone who's contributed and participated as well. That's really what we wanted to get with this webinar was um, a bit of interactivity. So I think that's, that's worked really well. Um, before we go, just a couple of additional resources that I want to point you towards to try and support you in your online case teaching. So I mentioned in the last webinar that we have a page on our website um, which lists all sorts of resources about online case teaching and online teaching generally. Um, articles, blogs, Q&As, links to recorded webinars. So I will include a link to that in our follow-up email and I really encourage you to go and have a look through the material that we have there. There's some fabulous things. Um, also, we've just announced today an online case workshop with Angela Lee, who ran our webinar last week. So this is going to be our first online workshop um, and it's going to be running in May. Um, it's going to cover two days on um, case teaching and two in, in class and two days on case teaching online. So if you want something more in depth, um, it's essentially a two day workshop but spread over four um, four hour sessions on different days and it's all going to be done online via Zoom. Um, it's synchronous um, and we're really trying to get a, an online classroom feel with that so the numbers are really limited. So I'm, I'm telling you guys in advance of the rest of the world so if you're interested in that you can go over to our website um, and have a look at the information on that. Um, there'll be a mailing going out later this week but I will include a link to that in your follow-up email as well. Um, so, yep, we'll be in touch tomorrow with the recording, um, with the slides and with links to the different resources. And it just remains to say thanks again, Martin and us. It's been a fabulous session. So oh. we, re we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much.